<coughs> okay. So I want to, uh, first of all, say how humbled I am uh, to be here. I, I, you probably don't all know this, but so many of you in the room have helped me uh, from a distance, mostly um, some close up um, in this path. So thank you. Um, so I want to talk today uh, about the Wisdom in Medicine Project, um, which is a journey that started a, f a few years ago um, when the Templeton Foundation asked uh, us in medicine, if you could study anything re relating to wisdom in your domain, what would you study? And at first I said, well, nothing, because I really don't know what wisdom is, and so I, I, you know, it's hard to start. But then I thought about it some more, and I knew exactly what I wanted to study. Um, and I wanted to study this. I wanted to study the path or the trip to hell and back. Um, because as a physician, there are so many situations that I can't really solve. I can't change the circumstances. Um, I can't fix the problem. But I have witnessed people who have... Uh, move through very difficult circumstances and come out the other end with something that fascinated me. And my question was, how did they do that? Um, and then, of course, uh, how can I help other people do that since I, I care for people all the time in difficult circumstances? So the Wisdom and Medicine Project was a three-year project funded by Templeton to investigate how people cope positively with difficult circumstance how they change, and whether those changes resemble how wisdom is described. We looked at two populations, which you're immediately going to think is weird. Um, these two populations are very different. Um, physicians who have made a serious medical error and patients who are suffering with chronic pain. I'll tell you why we studied those two in particular in a minute. Um, we used a mixed quantitative qualitative design, um, and uh, so did in-depth interviews and combined them with questionnaires on wisdom post-traumatic growth, personality, forgiveness, gratitude, and spirituality. So we chose these two populations, which on the surface are kind of odd bedfellows, because first of all, I was particularly interested, we as a, as a group actually were particularly interested in how to help these people. Um, and then secondly, I was interested in studying two different, very different populations dealing with very different uh, situations of adversity because I was actually interested to see what the commonalities were and whether there were any commonalities with how people move through this. So um, for today, I want to study, uh, I want to focus actually on the physician side of the study because I have to narrow it somehow. So um, physicians go into medicine to help people. Um, this was a, a, a photograph that actually went viral. I don't know if any of you saw it, but it's a physician grieving the loss of a young patient uh, after a trauma. Um, and in the viral uh, going around of this photo, there were many people who were surprised that physicians actually grieved, um, which is interesting in and of itself. So when things go wrong, whether there's a clear error or not a clear error, but things just don't go well, um, it's a devastating event. Physicians may uh, stop practicing, uh, burn out, even take their own lives, or practice defensively. But I had also witnessed physicians who had moved through these circumstances and come out uh, better doctors because of it. And as a patient safety expert, I was interested in how to foster that. How do we foster not just preventing mistakes, but learning from mistakes so that we could prevent the next one? So the study aims were to describe the positive changes that occur in response to adversity and to investigate whether these changes resemble how wisdom is described, to investigate the relationship between wisdom and these other factors, to delineate the important elements in the path that people take through adversity to wisdom in these particular circumstances, and then finally to describe what helps and what hinders positive growth. So we asked the 60 physicians who participate in this study these questions among others. Tell us a story about a, about a medical error in which you were involved. These were serious medical errors that we wanted them to talk about. Reflecting on that experience, has it changed you? If so, tell me about that. What helped you in this process? And then do you think you gained wisdom through this experience? If so, what does that mean to you? So thank goodness for uh, Monica's model because it was extraordinarily helpful to us in sort of grounding our conceptualization of wisdom and we use this as a framework in our delineation of exemplars from non-exemplars in the narratives. So the narratives of the interviews were scored by two separate researchers blinded to the scores on the 3D wisdom scale as either wisdom exemplars or non-exemplars. Hypothesis one was that the exemplars would score significantly higher than non-exemplars on measures of wisdom, post-traumatic growth, gratitude, forgiveness, spirituality, and positive emotion. 
and the hypothesis one was confirmed, except for post-traumatic growth, which was non-significant, but it was in the expected direction. So uh, these are just uh, the slides relating these, uh, these results. Um, so wisdom exemplars scored higher on the 3D wisdom scale, significantly higher. Um, highly on, higher on the daily spirit scale, which was the measure we used for spirituality. Uh, higher on the gratitude scale, which was, um, which was the, uh, G, the GQ6. Um, probably many of you are familiar with that. Higher on the forgiveness scale. So forgiveness, uh, for many reasons, is, a, is something I'm particularly interested um, in um, and its correlation with wisdom. Um, and it's a topic area for our next deep dive into the qualitative part of the study, the, into the qualitative interviews. Um, and then finally, um, the wisdom exemplar scored higher on the NA, NEO positive emotions scale. So all of this begs the, begs the question, of course, um, the chicken and egg question. Um, you know, how much of this is ameliorable or mitigatable or promotable or fosterable? Um, and that's particularly uh, what I'm interested in. So this is really um, just designed to convey the somewhat overwhelming nature of the correlations here. The uh, correlations that were significant are in bold. But in particular, I just wanted to point out one, I mean, there are many we could talk about, obviously, but um, one, which is the correlation between the scores on the 3D wisdom scale and distress. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute, but um, distress is something, the negative correlation between distress and and the 3D wisdom scale is something we don't talk about very much, but because of what the physicians told us about how, um, uh, about what helped them, I think it's an interesting uh, uh, situation to think about, and this may be some kind of sleeping giant in terms of how we might help people. Um, of course, that, that, that's the whole chicken and egg problem too, you know, how much can we actually, um, can we actually either balance uh, or mitigate the effects so what else did we find from the quantitative part of the study? Wisdom exemplars were more likely to have disclosed, meaning talked to, disclosed the error to the uh, patient family. Uh, and I guess uh, perhaps this suggests the truth is either a good teacher of wisdom or wise people tell the truth. Hard to, hard to say which. Um, wisdom exemplars agreed more strongly with the statement, I gained wisdom from this experience, which perhaps suggests that we actually do uh, know it when we experience it in a, in a context. So um, another aim of the study was to try to identify elements in the process of moving through adversity. And, and here are the process elements that we identified um, in the narratives. The first uh, is acceptance. Um, this, uh, this, uh, this ability to see things as they truly were, to just take in the actual situation of what had happened. One physician said, like any other big event in my life I didn't, I, that I couldn't immediately fix, I had to just say, I'm going to feel wrong about this no matter what, and I'm not going to be able to fix it. Um, and you know that, that just acceptance of the reality of what had happened. The second element uh, we termed stepping in. This was uh, to signify that it was a very active kind of moving into the situation. One physician said, I just wanted to run the other way. But in the end, that's not what we are about as physicians, we're there to take care of the patient. Stepping in for the physicians had to do with disclosure and apology. It had to do with learning about what happened, deeply learning about what happened, um, and taking responsibility for next steps. The third element was integration. Um, this had for the physicians uh, issues of dealing with imperfection. So it was them wrestling with the fact that they'd made the, this mistake with their previous notion of a good doctor, which also, which was often tied up completely with perfection. Um, it was about uh, decisiveness in the face of fallibility. How do I make strong and decisive decisions when I know actually that I can make this bad a mistake? The next element uh, in, this, in this process was the physicians then creating essentially a new narrative of what it is to be a doctor. Um, the imperfect but good doctor. Uh, it had often to do with changing the way they did their work. Um, uh, many of them talked about a new appreciation for teams. One physician said, I never really appreciated it up until now how we really can, if we work together and work together well, we can help fix each other's failings little bits at a time. And then finally, these physicians were able to generalize this deeper learning to the larger uh, frame and apply these life lessons more broadly. That often actually involved telling stories. 
about what had happened to teaching about it um, to the younger physicians coming along. So finally, there were th uh, these eight elements uh, identified in the answer to the question, what helped you in the process of moving through this difficult circumstance? I don't know if you can, can you read all of them? Okay. Um, it's interesting to think about how many of these things are really aimed at reducing distress and dealing with the e event in the moment, um, attending to those critical incidents in the moment when they occur could be essential to wisdom development. But there are also things that lend themselves on this list to proactive capacity development, if you will. Um, dealing with imperfection, having a moral context, forgiveness. Uh, for example, these could all be enhanced um, by things like mindfulness training, uh, loving kindness meditation, gratitude journaling, reframing, to name just a few. So in summary, when people describe the positive changes that resulted from their experience of adversity, they did use the language of wisdom. Wisdom exemplars had, on average, significantly higher scores on scales of gratitude, spirituality, forgiveness, and positive emotion. Important elements in the path through adversity included acceptance, stepping in, integration, new narrative, and wisdom. And then wisdom exemplars told us that talking about it, disclosure and apology, forgiveness, learning, helping, and teaching others helped them. So what's next? So um, a number of projects have grown out of this research. It seems to have taken on a life of its own. It's uncontrollable. Um, the Fernesis Project in Medical Education, uh, I just actually returned from uh, sh sh another Chicago meeting where of the uh, humanism in medicine. Uh, it was a national meeting on humanism in medicine. And uh, we actually started doing interviews about what does a wise physician look like? Um, and uh, in the interview, we actually asked physicians to tell us, tell me about a time when you think you made a wise decision, a wise decision or you acted wisely in medicine. What does that look like? Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, trying to get at what does uh, wisdom in medicine really look like. Um, the second, can we foster capacities for wisdom in medical students? So we have designed um, a longitudinal curriculum that is around uh, focusing Foster, or fostering capacities in, in, for wisdom in young medical students. And uh, we're following these students with measures of wisdom, resilience, burnout, uh, and uh, measures of well-being. And then finally, we've, dis we've, uh, we've designed a disclosure, uh, apology, and peer support program. Um, so uh, this is really an answer to can we mentor wisdom responses uh, to critical incidents. Uh, so this, this notion of how we attend to these critical incidents in the life of, of, of a physician. Um, and of course, you could, can extrapolate this to patients uh, perhaps as well. Um, may be critical in helping people develop wisdom as experiences happen to them on the hoof. So thank you very much uh, to Sh University of Chicago and the Templeton Foundation. Questions? Um, there's some evidence that uh, physicians are the most overconfident people around, right? measured by probability judgments versus true probabilities. Um, really? And, and, <laughs> and, you know, people suffer from all kinds of biases. People tend to self-deceive deceive often. There's motivated reasoning. It's very hard for me to believe, given the prevalence of these things, that there's not some value to them. Right, self-deception can be very useful when, uh, if if you're able to convince yourself that you're not responsible for someone's death, for instance, um, you seem to be denying that here. No, actually, no, no, not at all. Um, first of all, that's very much why I wanted to study mistakes in medicine, because um, frankly, when a physician faces his or her first big mistake, it is a huge hit to how they function. And either they move through this with being able to balance, yes, I'm imperfect and I'm, and I'm vulnerable to mistakes, and, but I actually have to make these critical decisions with very little time and with confidence. Um, so um, confidence without uh, arrogance is what people were aiming for in, the new in this, you know, forming a new narrative of what it means to be this different kind of doctor. 
Um, and they, it was an enormous struggle. It's kind of all tied up also with perfectionism. Um, we can't tolerate the idea of being imperfect because the consequence of our imperfection is so enormous that it's almost impossible to hold inside our beings. And yet being unaware of that or not having that you know, right here also puts us at risk for making arrogant or bad decisions or not recognizing. I mean, one thing, I do patient safety training, and one of the things that physicians need to actually work on um, is this capacity for knowing that they're capable of making a mistake. And so then being vigilant, A, and B, also using a team. Very hard to get doctors to, 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 to wrap that into their self-concept because we're trained to be the captain of the ship. We're trained to be the decision maker. And so it's hard for us to learn how to, to, and it's all tied up in exactly what you, that's a great comment, in exactly what you're talking about. Certainly I don't want a surgeon who's, you know, is standing with the scalpel and unable to make the cut, right? Because they're thinking, oh my God, if I cut something wrong, you know? We don't want that. Um, so it's a very delicate thing they're negotiating. Um, and to do that successfully, uh, it took, these people, for the most part, these physicians had made the mistakes they talked about many years ago. This wasn't yesterday. And it took them that many years to gain enough perspective on it to be able to talk about it in a way that they could actually have synthesized it. And now we're even teaching about it. Great Nancy question. Nancy and then Judith. Thank you for your presentation. Wonderful subject. Uh, I guess my concern is that the very structures under which physicians currently practice seems set up or designed in ways that discourage uh, the development of wisdom. I mean, we have systems today that I don't call patient care, I call them patient processing, where maybe you get, you get to see a nurse, a physician's assistant, maybe a physician for three to five minutes, that sort of thing. That kind of time pressure seems designed to produce errors, plus you have uh, problems with uh, medical malpractice lawsuits and insurance that seem to discourage the disclosure and apology uh, step here, which seems so important. I wonder if you could comment on those factors. Uh, oh, that, that, that's, uh, thank you for saying that, because um, I, I think that's a huge problem. Um, it's one of the reasons why we set up the disclosure, apology, and peer support program, um, because it's a whole culture change in medicine. It's the, it's the of course, we're vulnerable to mistakes because the time to think about you as a patient is short, and it's getting shorter. But also the time to reflect on you as a patient. So, so uh, there's an in a moment problem, but there's also the after an event problem. After an event in medicine, I don't know about, I don't know what you know about this, but after an event in medicine, basically everybody just goes back to the front line. There is not a moment of pause. So it's hard to. To, even as a student, it's hard to learn from the mistakes you see going by because you have no time to reflect. You, there's no process to reflect. There's no kind of atmosphere of, um, of that kind of deep learning. So changing that is, a, I think, going to be a big part of us getting better. Great comment. Judith. Thank you very much. I think this is totally fascinating work that you've been doing. Um, and it reminded me of discussions we've had where I come from um, because we have a trauma group that's actually doing research on um, intergenerational transmission of trauma um, basically originating from the Holocaust so a long time ago. And we've been discussing the, the major differences that we expect there to be between like perpetrators and victims in that case. And so, that, so I was really, really interested in the fact that you were kind of looking at perpetrators kind of trauma, a trauma that you've caused, uh, some, have caused something to happen instead of having had something happen to you. And you said in the beginning that you were actually interested in the commonalities between these two groups, but what you've been talking about sounds like a very fascinating and totally different kind of development. So did you see any commonalities or was it really more differences than commonalities between these very different types of trauma? Um, I think there were, there were plenty of differences, but there were very deep like very deep level, human level commonalities with how people moved through difficult circumstances. So um, although you're right, exactly, I mean, one we chose was, was a mistake. It was a, something that someone we had caused, I had caused. And the other it was more something they had by no fault of their own. Although interestingly, um, 
I do think that, and it, and it came out a little bit, that underlying many um, patients' uh, experience of adversity or illness, there is this little underlying you know, concern about did I do something? Um, and in particular, pain patients struggle with that because pain is such a um, subjective experience. And so the, it's, it's a little bit tied up with that. So there are many ways actually in which the populations were more similar than they seem on the, on the outside. Um, but I think in general, there were more, more similarities than differences, but there were really key important differences that um, obviously we have yet to explore all of them. So. Another question? Uh, Keeler? I was wondering if you could quickly mention what ideas you guys are considering for this, this curriculum for uh, training doctors to practice more wisely. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is such a new area um, that it was, it's hard to, um, it's hard to come up with uh, really concrete things. Uh, what we're doing is um, basically we've kind of taken the what we're identifying as some of the basic uh, capacities for wisdom development um, and trying to integrate them into a curriculum from, from day one. One of the most important being, you know, if, if, if wisdom is um, being able to see the deeper meaning of what we do, one of the things that medical students suffer from within the first two years is they lose the meaning of why they ever became a doctor to begin with. And that's when burnout comes, that's when lack of empathy starts, that it's like the whole train starts going off the rails. So we match students with patients, their own patients, just two of them. They become their family and the, the, the medical student is the family's patient, I mean the family's medical student, if you know what I mean. Uh, we match them from day one. Um, and so that everything they're learning is learning in a context of a longitudinal relationship with a patient who is moving through their own experiences of illness and wellness and uh, growing older. Um, and so developmentally, in, in some ways, we have something to look at. Um, we also are fostering uh, reflective practice, so they're learning mindfulness. They're actually doing narratives uh, and doing reflective writing. Um, we are specifically uh, building in uh, times and places and ways to deal with critical incidents so that uh, when students see things uh, or experience things, that we, they have a context in which to uh, now reflect on them before they get buried in, you know, the, the whole mess of being a medical, medical student. So it, you get the idea that we're trying to build in um, and build those capacities as the students. I have absolutely no idea if this is going to, you know, do anything, but we're trying it. And the last question goes to Soph. Yeah, I was just wondering what the specialties were, the physicians that you were looking at, and if there are any differences between different specialties. We had a pretty good spread of specialties, actually, including, I mean, we thought that some major differences would be in the surgical subspecialties or versus non-surgical. It turns out not, not, not anything that was uh, particularly significant. Um, I'm not sure what that tells me, except that basically I think our, our doctor training and our doctor duties are, are very similar in many ways, um, and we're obviously similar as human beings. Um, I think that in the narratives, the stories of the surgeons had a, had a different feel to them. Um, surgeons will tell you that there's nothing that feels more direct than you actually causing, I mean, I'm an internist, all I can do is miss a diagnosis or think wrong about somebody. It's a little bit more distant than when someone actually slices your aorta, you know, and they weren't supposed to. Um, so the surgeons, <laughs> the surgeons feel a very direct um, and, and very severe uh, responsibility and criticism of themselves. Thank Good you. Good question.